Hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to click below to subscribe and share. It's not just about the photograph, it's the outdoor experience. Keep in mind everything that you need to know about photography. F-stop, shutter speed, lens selection. Nice photo, I've got beautiful light now. Oh my God. I'm your host, Doug Gardner, and your wild photo adventure starts now. You know, as photographers, our goal is to tell a story in one single photograph, but often they're stories that can't be fully told without the use of video. This week, I'm in the Tennessee mountains in and around the Cades Cove area, and I'm going to be showing you how to take stunning videos with a camera you probably already own. I'm your host, Doug Gardner, and your wild photo adventure starts now. Now, if you're watching this show, you probably already have an interest in photography, and more than likely, you own one of these, a DSLR camera, or a digital single lens reflex camera. Not only are these cameras capable of shooting high quality still photographs, they shoot amazing broadcast quality HD video as well. Now, I'm not trying to turn you guys into pro filmmakers, and I'm not gonna get into the history and the theory of video. I'm simply going to show you how to use your DSLR to capture beautiful video. So first there are a few things you need to know. Digital video is measured in FPS or frames per second because all video really is is many individual still photographs that are captured in rapid succession. Now there are many different formats and frame rates that you can choose from and they range from 24 frames per second, 30, 60 and even higher. As you become more advanced, you can make your own decision about which frame rate and format works best for you. But for now, let's stick with the industry standard, which is 30 frames per second. This means that for every one second of video, there's 30 still frames. The other thing you need to know is frame size. Being that most of the cameras today shoot high definition video, you'll have two frame sizes to choose from, 1920 by 1080 and 1280 by 720. Now this refers to the physical size of the video. So let's take 1920 by 1080 for example. 1920 refers to 1920 pixels wide by 1080 pixels high. Now if you ever have plans for actually broadcasting your footage on television, you'll want to choose 1920 by 1080. However, if you're simply going to burn DVDs and watch it on your personal television at home or share it over the internet with friends, the 1280 by 720 will look absolutely gorgeous. All right, so let's get your camera set up for video now. Now keep in mind, the menus for different brand cameras are, they're gonna be similar, but there will be slight differences in the way the directories are laid out. So be sure to look at your manual for your particular camera. All right, so we wanna to go to the main directory of the menu, and we wanna scroll down to video system. And at that point, we wanna select that and go to NTSC. We want to return back to our main menu, and then we want to scroll down to our live view or movie function mode. And we will have an option there for movie record size. There you'll have several options, 1920 by 1080, 1280 by 720, or even 640 by 480. So I'm going to select 1920 by 1080, 30p, which is the 30 frames per second. We'll select that and we'll return back to our main menu. From there, we wanna scroll down to sound recording. Select that, and we want that on. All right, so we're now ready to shoot video. Let's go find our first subject.
What a great way to start our morning. We've got a nice mature whitetail buck right out here in front of us, and we're in an open forest area. We have fall color, so good light, and you know this ought to be a really good morning. Now, when we're determining the exposure, there's a lot of things we've got to keep in mind. In this area, we have a lot of shade, and then we have some open pockets of bright light. In determining our exposure for video, First thing we want to do is we want to go to put the camera in manual mode. This gives us the greatest flexibility when trying to um, adjust and compensate our exposure. Put our camera in live view mode. With video, you're not going to be looking through the viewfinder anymore. You're going to be watching the back of your LCD screen and you're going to be adjusting the camera using the handle of your, your fluid head. So the first thing we need to set is our shutter speed. Now this is a little bit different than what you're used to as a photographer. In photography, most of the times we want the highest shutter speed we can so we get nice tack sharp images. In video, we want to use what's called the 180 degree rule. Now this is an industry standard rule, everybody knows about it, and basically all it means is that your shutter speed is going to be double your frame rate. Now remember, we chose 30 frames a second as our frame rate, so our shutter speed is going to be 1 60th of a second. We're going to set that, and you'll think to yourself, well that's going to give me blurry images because 1 60th of a second is pretty slow. Actually not. When you think about video, one second of video is made up of 30 individual still frames. You want a little bit of blur between each one of those frames. That makes the video look more natural. If you chose a higher shutter speed and a higher frame rate, then it would appear more jittery, almost a very digitized look but we want something that's much more natural looking. So we're gonna choose 1 60th of a second. Once you've set the shutter speed, you're gonna leave that where it is. That doesn't change. From this point on, you're gonna only use your ISO rating and your f-stop to change your exposure. So we always wanna start at the lowest ISO that we can get away with because that helps us control digital noise, especially in an area like this where we have a lot of dark shade digital noise can be a problem. So we're gonna start at 100 ISO. And from this point on, I wanna use an aperture that will give me a correct exposure. If 100 ISO will not give you the proper f-stop to get the correct exposure, you have to start up in that ISO. Only get that ISO as high as you need it to get a proper exposure. Now with some cameras, there are third-party firmware updates that are available for your camera that will give you a live histogram. And that way you can properly monitor your exposure as you're videoing. Most of the cameras do not come with that. Some of them have what we call zebra stripes or blinkies is what everybody's used to hearing them referred to as. And those show you the areas of your scene that are overexposed. The zebra stripes look like little lines. Some cameras actually have flashing white areas that show you overexposure. With video, you've got basically three options. You can use continuous autofocus if your camera offers that. If you don't have that, you're going to pretty much be confined to two other options. One is using the autofocus on button in the back, which we call the bump method. So you would basically put the subject uh, in whatever composition you like and hit the autofocus on button on the back of the camera, acquire shop focus, and then let off. And as long as the subject stays in that area, then you're going to be okay. But as soon as that subject moves either away from the camera or closer to the camera, you're going to have to follow him and hit that autofocus on button again and acquire sharp focus. So there are some obvious disadvantages to that. That leads me to manual focus. Now manual focus is, is by far going to be the best way to go. Now the way I manually follow focus, first thing I do is I want to get the subject so that I can see the eye of the animal. Now, if the animal's close enough, you can almost always see a catch light in their eye, which is basically a specular highlight. They're the first thing that you can tell when you've reached critical focus. It'll, it'll become really sharp and it'll just kind of crack into focus. Now, different camera manufacturers are going to, you know, the, the direction that you turn the ring may be different. So, test your lens first. But I know with my lens that for a subject moving closer to me, I turn the focusing ring clockwise, which an uh, easy way for me to remember is subject closer, thumbs up. So when I rotate this barrel, my thumb goes up. Subject moving farther away, thumb down. You can do some really cool things by being able to manual focus. Number one, you can film in a thick area that has a lot of trees and sticks and stuff in the way and film the animal as he's going through brush without, say, autofocus trying to jump on and off. 
once you get more advanced, you can shift focus where I focus on one subject and then I shift the focus to maybe a subject behind that. And it really kind of draws the viewer into your video. Now, if you find yourself having trouble uh, actually seeing your LCD screen, especially in bright sunlight while you're trying to manually focus, there are some third party products out there that are designed to attach to your LCD screen. And basically what it is, it looks like uh, the viewfinder of a traditional video camera. It's got a little eye cup and you put your eye down to it. And what this will do, this will shade any extraneous light off of the LCD screen and it'll help you um, um, achieve critical focus when you're uh, in there real close trying to look at those fine details. Now, I like to shoot at very shallow depth of fields like with an aperture of f4, f5, 6, something like that, because what it does, it compresses the scene and it makes the animal pop out of the frame and it makes the background really nice and blurred and everything in the foreground in front of the subject nice and blurred. So it focuses the viewer's attention right on your subject and it gives you that nice film look to it. The bad side to that is that it is extreme because you have such a shallow depth of field now it's extremely hard to keep that critical focus um, you know, on a subject that's moving around. You know, while you're learning, I would use the smaller f-stops and have the benefit of using more depth of field and a little more forgiveness. And once you get the hang of it and you really, you've had some practice um, manually focusing, then try to start using those, um, those larger f-stops. Now you do not have to have a big 500 millimeter or 600 millimeter lens like this to get great footage. Uh, this is strictly a creative decision on my part. I like the look and feel that it gives me. But you need to also understand that different lenses give you different amounts of depth of field at different apertures. All right, well these turkeys are moving into the woods now. I'll tell you what, there's a lot to see here and I've got lots more tips that I want to share with you on how to video, so let's go see what we can find. Now just like with photography, a good tripod and head is one of the most critical things that you need to be considering. Poor camera support will ruin your imagery. Now when you're shooting video, you want to make sure you have a solid, smooth support so that you have uninterrupted, stable video. DSLR cameras are relatively lightweight. Now this gives you some options in the type of head that you want to use. You've got the gimbal style head which is really nice because it is based on true balance points. That's the way this thing operates and it really has no weight limits. So that's an excellent choice when you're used, doing long lens work, anything from say a 300 millimeter lens and up. Uh, excellent choice. Then you have the traditional pan and tilt video head here. And this is a very smooth head. And the reason it's so smooth is because it actually has fluid in the head and as you move, the fluid is forced through a series of channels and baffles which creates resistance and results in really smooth pans and tilts. When you're using a video head, you have to have a leveling base attached to the top part of your tripod. But what this allows you to do, it allows you to get the camera head completely level when you're working off of uneven ground. Now, that's kind of a pro and a con with video. Uh, yeah, it's required. Every time you move the tripod, if I move it two inches, I have to re-level now. Um, but what it allows you to do by getting that head completely level, when you're doing pans across the horizon, those horizon lines will be level. Otherwise, as you pan, you'll be going uphill or downhill. Now, in my opinion, for most of your DSLR video work, a traditional photography tripod like this with a video fluid head attached to it is going to suit most of your needs quite well. Try to keep your tripod as low to the ground and the legs spread as wide as you can because this will make your tripod and your support that much more stable. Now if you're going to be doing long lens work with zoom telephoto lenses, you got to remember the longer the lens, the more critical focus and stability are going to be. 
Now this is an example of a traditional video tripod. You generally see this with a lot of the broadcast cameras because traditionally broadcast cameras are much bigger and much heavier so you need that extra support. But the legs have a fluted design, it's multi-shaft, and the theory behind that is the more shafts you have coming up from the ground to the, the head, the more it disperses vibration. You don't need anything like this until you decide you really want to get into video and you're going to be using large broadcast uh, style cameras which are much heavier and physically much larger. Um, just so you'll know something like this rig right here is about $10,000. So um, just a little FYI for you. Wow, this is spectacular. I tell you, you can't come to the mountains in the fall with all this beautiful color and not take time to do some video clips of the streams and the trees with all the beautiful color. This, this is going to be really nice and it's a good place to share with you a few more techniques. One of the nice things about DSLR cameras is their low light sensitivity. Uh, they perform very well in low light and you know sometimes they allow you to get videos that you might not otherwise get. With the camera I'm shooting today I should be able to get some nice color low light without a whole lot of digital noise. Now the thing you need to consider is that, just like with still photography, you want to shoot streams and fall colors on an overcast day or bright overcast. And that's what we've got here. Not only are we overcast, but we're in the shade side of a, of a mountain slope, as you can see here behind me. The shot I want here is we've got this beautiful tree here with the root system spidering out down to the water. There's obviously colorful leaves all over the ground. We have the stream coming down along behind me here. And then we got a mountain slope with lots of yellow color above. So this would be a, a good place to share with you how to do pans and tilts uh, and be creative with that. Until you learn how to eyeball what the correct exposure is just by looking at the screen, you may want to consider just snapping a picture and then pull up your histogram, and it's just like any picture that you've been taking in still photography. You'll look at that histogram and say, okay, I'm slightly overexposed or I'm underexposed. So that's an option for you as well. Now we need to focus. This is no different than if we were shooting a still photograph. It's called hyperfocal distance, and we want to focus one third into the scene. So if I look across this scene, I know I want the leaves to the other side of the slope here in sharp focus. So I kind of visually divide that into thirds. So I know one third away from the camera is all about the middle of the stream here. So I'm going to point the camera down there and I use my magnification button here so I can see a lot of detail. And I will go ahead and focus that. All right, we got nice and sharp focus. Bring it back out to full view. All right. Now I'm going to double check where I'm going to end up with my tilt move. All that's going to look good. And I'm going to start up here. All that looks really good. The other thing I need to check is my white balance. Because we are on an overcast day and in the shade of a mountain, it'll have a tendency to be a little blue. The color of the light will be a little blue. So I'm going to manually set my Kelvin scale. So just hit the Kelvin scale, and we're at 5100 right now, and it's a little warm, so I'm going to back it down to 5000. That looks pretty good. It looks natural to that. So we'll find our starting point, and I usually kind of just do a little practice shot here. Don't forget to hit the record button. It sounds silly. I can't tell you how many times I've actually gone through the movements and realized later after I'd left I forgot to hit the record button. Alright, so we're going, we're now recording and I always give it about five seconds before I start. And with these fluid heads you just gradually want to make your way down as smoothly as you possibly can and then I'll slowly come to a stop and let it rest and try to hold it there for about another three to five seconds. The unique thing about this spot right here is that there's so many video clip options from this one spot that I'm standing. I actually see another scene right here that I'd like to do. Whether you lock the video head down completely still and the water is moving by or an animal is moving through the frame, that's movement. You always want some kind of movement with video, no matter whether it's the animal or the actual camera moving. It adds a lot more impact. 
to the shot. The possibilities here are absolutely just endless. So, you know, you got to kind of make order out of chaos. We've changed our, our position here. So what we've got, we've got a big boulder right in front of us and it's almost like a terrace effect. And there's multiple little cascades, which is really nice. Exposure is still dead on the money, but I need to uh, double check my focus. So I want to divide the scene into thirds, look for something one third out into the, into the scene. So probably that second big boulder is probably what I want to focus on. And here we go. And you just want it as smooth as you possibly can. I can't stress enough how important it is to have a good, solid fluid head to do this kind of stuff with. All right, that looks good. Now we're talking about the, uh, having movement. We can also do a scene where we take this one little cascade, maybe zoom in a little bit, and then lock the tripod down. And because there's a lot of movement already with the water coming over the rocks, uh, we can just sit here and record this. When I'm shooting stock video with wildlife, the longest continuous clip you can get uninterrupted and with scenes a minimum of 10 to 15 seconds. Well, let's keep going. There's a lot to see in this area and uh, a lot of video clips to be taken. They're saying there's some possible weather coming in, possible snow tonight, and I can already tell a big difference. So I broke out my, my winter uh, outdoor clothing so I can be nice and warm. I saw two or three deer cross this stream yesterday evening. The light was pretty contrasty, couldn't really do a whole lot with it. But you know what? It's such a beautiful scene with the stream coming by and the fall colors around the edge of the stream. This, this could be really magnificent. So I've swapped out the lens, my 500 for a 300 because I want to show more of the environment. I don't want just a full body deer shot. Anytime you're dealing with animals in the wild, it's always a gamble. Only thing I know is that I saw deer crossing down there and it looks like a pretty well-worn path. So the best thing I can do is pre-focus on that path and uh, you know that would shorten the, my reaction time. If something did come splashing across there, I, I wouldn't have to um, do as much work to get sharp focus. So I'm gonna go ahead and pre-focus. I'm gonna magnify the screen and manual focus on that bank where I think they're gonna come out. All right, everything's looking good. It's just a waiting game now. Wow, was that not spectacular? You know, it's experiences like this that just keep me coming back time and time again. We had the three does come down right and stand right in front of us, and then we had deer right here beside us. Um, you know, I was a little tight when they were in front of me, but it's moments like that that you pick out small elements out of the scene. Do things like the head and the neck. Look for other small details like you know, when they're picking their foot up and you know, there's water dripping off or just the tail switching, um, you know, little elements like that. And if you cut all of those together in your editing process, you have a really nice story. We started out with really low light and the fog started rolling in. And just for a brief moment, when the deer decided to cross, we had a couple rays of sunshine and now it's back to heavy overcast. And I even feel some rain starting to fall now, but you know what? That's the way it goes. Tell you what? Let's get out of here, 
see what else we can find, maybe do some more scouting because there is rumors of possible snow tonight, but we know how that goes. Well, the weather report was right. We had snow last night and it was snowing early this morning. Because the snow is sticking to the trees at the higher elevation, they've got a lot of trees down on the road, so the Park Service has closed the cove. So we're just gonna hang out down here at the bottom of the hill and see if we can take advantage of possibly picking up some detail shots, you never know. You gotta uh, make lemonade out of lemons, right? As a photographer, I truly enjoy getting out and enjoying the colorful mountains, the cooler temperatures, and the active wildlife. Whether I'm shooting photographs or video, it's magical places like this that allow me to truly be creative. More information about this week's show is available online. And remember, it's not just about the photograph or the video in this case, it's the outdoor experience. I'm Doug Gardner for Wild Photo Adventures. As a photographer, you know it's autumn, not you know. I'm not going to get into the history and video theory. We want to shed up. We want to shed. All right, I think I've got my scoop excursion. Now, deal, 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 deal. Slip. <laughs> Same rock. Hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to click below to subscribe and share.